abandon hope, all ye who click subscribe. Welcome to Rotted Review of the Day, and today I'm going to do something that I think might be impossible. Let's find out together as I make our way through a spoiler-free review of 1911's L'Inferno, the oldest full-length feature film horror movie ever, the first full-length feature feature-length movie to come out of Italy ever, and the first movie with full frontal nudity ever. And it wasn't until more than 50 years later that another movie <laughs> came around to do the same thing. This movie, make no mistake, is chock full of miserable naked people. <laughs> That's one of the things I got out of it. All right, so <laughs> I wanted to cover this one because I honestly do love classic horror movies. I love classic movies in general. But I kind of wanted to take it upon myself to challenge myself and find, you know, go back in time as far, far back as I could to establish a baseline, to establish some historical context for horror films, what the, where origin was, where their first step might have been, and then to take a good long look at that. And in that research, I came across L'Inferno. Now... This is obviously a silent movie. This is not a talkie. Uh, it was put back out there in 2004 with a new kind of music overlay soundtrack from Tangerine Dream, and that's the version I watched. It was has a lot of footage restored, uh, found some in the film archives that they brushed up and digitized and restored a bit and got it to as good as they possibly could and put out there with this Tangerine Dream back end. And... Uh, first of all, I'm glad that I watched it with the Tangerine Dream music. At the same time, I wish I hadn't. Here's the reason for that, is because I loved it with that. I thought it worked really, really well. But, that gets me thinking, did I like the movie because of the soundtrack? Because, I mean, soundtrack has a big influence on our perception of how we take in a movie. It is a huge element to that. And this particular case, that soundtrack was not part of the original vision. It wasn't obvious, you know, obviously Tangerine Dream wasn't around in 1911. So did I enjoy the original movie? You know, was my experience of watching this corrupted? I think that is an element for discussion, possibly uh, debate. I don't know, but I did watch it. I did watch it with the Tangerine Dream back end, and I did love it. So, uh, this movie is a put-to-screen adaptation of Dante's Inferno, and I had read this book back in high school, well, the poem, at least. Uh, you know, I mean, it's a poem as long as a book, but I had read it back in high school. I probably understood a good 5% of it, which was pretty good uh, for a high school student. And, it, you know, I've, I've picked up more as the years go by, and I've reread it uh, one or two times since then, and I get more out of it each time. It's still, a, a, you know, not the easiest read out there, but it was really interesting watching it put to screen and uh, watching the visual interpretation of what they were capable of doing in 1911 with special effects and editing effects and camera effects that it was able to take something as visually complex as Dante's Divine Comedy and make it happen visually. It was pretty incredible. So <clears throat> this is why I say that this is almost impossible to do, and I'm, I'm still maintaining that I don't know which way I'm going to go with this. I got the scores written down, as always, five different categories, each category worth up to 20 points for a total possible score of 100 points. And if you put yourself in my shoes in this very minute, you're going to understand why I'm going to have difficulty with this. How do I judge this movie with historical context in today's world? It's, you know, I don't want to be 
one end or the other. I know that there's some people out there that, you know, if it's if it's old, then that means it's brilliant across the board. There's no flaws with it. And if you find any flaws with it, then you're just a Philistine and <laughs> that's the end of it. And they will defend that to the death, sipping their lattes. Then there's the other side where they will, you know, th they have no time for old stuff that doesn't matter anymore. And what's this grainy film blur stuff that's happening there. That's BS. <laughs> I'm going to go, I don't know, <laughs> uh, watch the Nightmare on Elm Street remake because darn it, that's modern storytelling at its finest. <laughs> I don't want to fall in either of those camps. If it has flaws, I want to point them out. It, but at the same time, I hold reverence and I respect the filmmaking style and what they were able to accomplish. Make no mistake that what they were able to accomplish had never been done before. Certainly, if you look at Western films of that era, this had cinematography that was heads and tails beyond anything that, you know, America or, 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 or other any other film, I think, around this time was able to do. And it did it in a believable fashion for that time. And that's the point. That's the point of why this is difficult for me is how do you have a creature like Cerebus where it's obviously a puppet uh, and, you know, it's, it's heads are being manipulated and they're basically just, you know, foam and they're bleh, 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 and it's happening at, you know, 10 frames per second with, you know, warbles happening there. If that was happening in a movie that came out in theaters, you know, tomorrow, it, I, I would be railing against it. But that was brilliant for its time. So in modern times, how do I accurately judge with historical context what's going on without also blowing smoke up its butt and giving it judgment that is fair, you know, if it is flawed? So here we go. I'm just going to go ahead and try it. I got my scores written down, and I'm going to recite them, and I'm going to try and defend them, and let's see how this goes. Plot? Uh, I gave the plot 20 out of 20. I'm sorry, but I am not going to give Dante's Inferno any less than that. You know, and Considering that's the source material and it stayed fairly faithful to it, you know, if it succeeded, you know, whether or not it succeeded, that's going to be the second category. But the first category, the plot, I am going to give Dante's Inferno 20 out of 20 any day of the week, and I'm not going to apologize for it. So, moving on, the intent, whether or not it succeeded with that. Um, I think by and large, it absolutely did. I gave this 15 out of 20 points, and I'm going to try and explain why, is with the special effects that were available at the time and the camera effects that they were trying to come up with, uh, the effects there were solid and sold me. And there were parts of this that was, that were, that was pretty disturbing to watch. I'm not going to say it was scary and we're going to get into the fear quotient at, at the end there, but it was disturbing to watch because a lot of Dante's Inferno is disturbing. The, you know, heads sticking up out of the ice on the, the last, uh, you know, circle of hell there before you get to Satan himself. And, you know, the guy eating the other guy's skull, it was, I thought that was pretty well done. Um, but I think the reason that I didn't give this uh, 20 out of 20 on the intent is because there was a certain sense of monotony. A lot of the elements of this movie did feel repetitive. There are only so many scenes where you have two dozen naked people writhing about that, you know, okay, well, this is the first circle and this is the heretics and this is the, uh, uh, the, 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 the people that have profited from the church and this is it. But ultimately it's like, this is two dozen writhing naked people. This is two dozen writhing naked people. This is two dozen writhing naked people. And there were differences, but it did feel repetitive. So yeah, I'm going to judge that. I think that that is something that they could have addressed. I think that is something that they could have worked on. And so overall brilliant, but 15 out of 20 for the intent, the acting, Oh, the acting. Oh, okay. This is another one. That's really tough. This is a silent movie. And I would imagine I haven't been able to look up any, historical resumes for any of the actors in this, but I would imagine that a lot of them had worked in stage productions before 
being put in front of a camera. And even if they hadn't, they're being put in front of a camera for a silent movie. And that means there's going to be overacting galore. It's, you know, you're not going to have subtle, you know, you know, I, I love you moments. It's going to, it's going to have a lot of very exaggerated overacting moments. And that's just the way that it needs to be. It's a silent film. And these are classical actors that have worked on stage. And that is just the way they're, you know, they don't have a voice and they don't have the luxury of high def close ups to sell subtle performances. This is a production and it's uh, one that requires a lot of exaggeration in the movements and in the, in the body language, because that's the only language there is. But at the same time, <laughs> Yeah, you can take that too, uh, 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 too far. You can take it too far. I gave the acting 12 out of 20 points. I think to judge it fairly, I understand the historical context. I understand where they're coming from. But at some points, it was a bit laughable. Uh, so, <laughs> moving on. Man, I am going to get railed on for this review. That's all right. I can only speak to my heart and my honesty here. Um the technical portions of this, I gave 15 out of 20 points. And I, you know, what was put there was really, really good. And, uh, you know, I, I have to say, for the time. And I do apologize for that, but I can't really get around it. It, it, it is for the time. But. Like I said, if, if I was watching this coming out in theaters tomorrow, I'd be looking at every single, you know, skipped frame and jump point and, you know, as they're doing the the chroma, you know, well, not chroma, but the, the, the keyed overlay, you know, how somebody's arm would disappear when they're actually, when they're accidentally going into the next, you know, shot that's been matted over. Yeah, I mean, I, I would be railing on it. That's just the absolute truth of it, is there's no way that this would hold, you know, any kind of water. But in 1911, it was the cat's pajamas. It was better than anything else anybody had ever made. And even if it wasn't, it was still very fledgling technology. It was them pushing the boundaries in, in ways that nobody had ever done before. So um, I think giving credit where credit's due... On the special effects, knowing what we know and knowing how they were some of the forerunners of making this possible, high, high, high marks. The reason it's not a 20 out of 20 for the technical is because of some of the things that I mentioned before. The shots were a bit monotonous. They were a bit repetitive. I'm not talking about the ones with the special effects. I'm actually talking about the ones without. Some of the settings were good, but, uh, you know, the the way that they were framed did get repetitive and did get monotonous. And that is something that could have been remedied in, in a filmmaking style at that time. You know, it, it's not like I'm expecting them to put CG in there or anything, but, you know, getting a shot and trying to say, okay, well, uh, you know, scenes three, six, uh, 17, 19 and 24 are pretty much all exactly the same. How can we, spice up you know half of them and make them differentiate i don't think that that is an unreasonable thing to say the fear quotient this is me being fair to my scoring system and i stand by my scoring system perhaps it wouldn't be fair to judge this as a horror movie but it is i mean it is the first full-length horror movie and i think that having it in the rotted channel is something that I really, really wanted to do. But putting it through the same scoring system and being fair to all the other movies that I review and taking that and putting it in this one, I got to give it a fear quotient of zero. There were parts of it that were interesting and even going so far as to say bordering on creepy. The Satan thing was bordering on creepy. The guy eating the back of the guy's skull was bordering on creepy. But I wouldn't say that anything ever got to the point of even remotely scary. And that's not to say that that is 
bad. I'm just saying that in the scoring system, to be fair to everybody, to, you know, this movie and all the other movies that I've reviewed and all the other movies that I will be reviewing and putting them all on the same playing field, which is exactly how I should be doing this, it's a zero. So, total score of 62 out of 100 points. Spiritually, I give this a 100 out of 100, and it's just a beautiful film all around, and I am going to hold it in forever high reverence. And not only do I recommend seeing it, I think it should be required viewing for any horror fan. It You need to have historical context. You need to know where the roots of your hobby and your enjoyment come from. This is critical. And not only is it critical viewing, but it's also readily accessible. YouTube has probably, you know, a dozen or so different versions of this movie with different soundtracks and different backstories or, you know, different levels of quality of upload and so forth. But it's public domain. It's 1911. You can watch it for free darn near anywhere. And you absolutely should set aside about an hour and 15 minutes because that's about all it is and make it happen. Watch this movie. I really do recommend it. It, it, it is something that is, I think, important. I am going to break from what I usually do, and I'm going to not have a deep dive discussion. The reason for that being it, Dante's Inferno is a well-known thing. There's really not a lot of points that I really need to dig into to get a basis of uh, a spoilery discussion kind of thing. I'm, I want to have discussion on this movie. You know, if you think I'm wrong, which you probably do, this is going to be a fairly polarizing opinion video. Please leave them in the comments down below. I will be reading them and responding to them and engaging with them. Uh, but we're going to do it in this this video and not a deep dive. I just get the sense that there's really just not a whole lot for me to cover there. A lot of this movie was a title card generally describing what's going on. You know, Dante, uh, you know, sees somebody that he recognizes and so on and uh and that's it and then the movie displays that for five minutes or so and moves on to the next scene there, it's just it doesn't have a whole lot of overarching character development plot points that we're so used to now that really warrants massive amounts of discussion this is more the kind of movie that warrants instead of a overall discussion a scholarly examination and that's really just not my thing. Uh, and it's been done to death in a million other videos. I really would be just covering old ground. And ultimately, I'm going to get to the point, if I try to make a deep dive, of repeating myself over and over. And just coming up with this exact same review worded differently. And I don't see the point in that. I'm not going to drag you down to go to that level. So instead, this video ran long. And... We're going to call this the entirety of the rotted review of Dante's Inferno. And I thank you for sticking with me on this one. So that should about do it. Remember, next time you want to watch a horror movie, first make sure that it's good and rotted.